Hey, good morning. Hey, great to see you all. So I have to start off with kind of, kind of a funny story. So, you know, um, in preparation for speaking, one of the things I did is that you go through and you, and I time, I time my talk. You know, how long is it? And so I did that the first time. Came in at just under 53 minutes. <laughs> and, I'm, and, and at first I'm thinking, I need to cut this down. But then I'm like, it's Marathon Sunday. 53 minutes sounds about right for Marathon Sunday. So I didn't touch a thing. You'll be glad to know that. Didn't touch a thing. Uh, I'm sure it'll just zoom by really quickly. But All right, I was kidding about that. In case anybody's going to get up and walk out. But let me start, though, by asking, because tomorrow is the 128th running of the Boston Marathon, do we have anybody here who is running the marathon? And I'm going to ask you to stand up if we do. And if you don't want to stand up because you're embarrassed, well, tomorrow you're getting ready to run in front of a million people. So you got to get over that. Anybody? Do we have any runners? Really? All right. We'll still pray for you at the end, just in case someone didn't stand up. But um, no, it's great to see. So, so one of the things that, um, that Pastor Mike mentioned at the beginning, if you were here, was um, it's 128th running of the marathon. But it also happens to be, right, the 100th running of the marathon with its start line in Hopkinton. So it's, uh, it's kind of a milestone year for the marathon. And I know that there's a little bit of kind of some shady history about how the marathon moved from, it always was in Ashland before that. And then, and then it moved to Hopkinton 100 years ago. And so, you know, as a, as a long time Hopkinton resident. I, you know, I do just want to say to any Ashland residents who might still be kind of bearing a grudge about that, you know, I just want to say, get over it because, because we're, not moving, we're not moving the start line back to Ashland. Okay, it's staying in Hopkinton. But anyway, um, so it's a milestone year, right? 2024, a milestone year for the hundreds, but it's a milestone year, you know, for another reason too. You might know this. Now, I'm not talking about I'm not talking about that 100 years ago, both Jimmy Carter and George H.W. Bush were born, right? I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about that 200 years ago was when Beethoven's Ninth Symphony made its debut. I'm not talking about that, but that's another reason. 300 years ago, right, Gabriel Fahrenheit invented the mercury thermometer. That happened... Th Probably what you all were thinking about was 300 years ago, so pretty monumental. It did also happen to be when uh, the first Congregational Church of Hopkinton was founded, uh, later to be called Faith Community Church. 300 years ago, 1724. So there'll be a lot more talk about that, but here's a, a, a digital image on the left side there you see is the original uh, covenant of First Congregational Church, which we still recite to this day for new members. And over on the, the right side there is the first entry into the, to the official records, September 2nd, 1724. So pretty cool. Uh, there's, it's more than just the 100th anniversary of Hopkinton being the start line. We'll hear more about it. It's the 300th anniversary of our brand new church uh, having gotten its start, which is pretty cool. Now, before we go any further, uh, so my name is Kurt Cooperider. I know a lot of you, but a lot of you I don't. My family's been part of uh, Faith Community Church for decades, and now we primarily worship in Framingham. And one thing I wanted to do was extend an invitation to you all. If you've never had a chance to visit the Framingham campus, to come and pay us a visit. I'm not saying that because I'm trying to get people to move from Hopkinton to Framingham. I mean, we want to grow, but we don't want to grow that way. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of similarities between Framingham and Hopkinton. Uh, always has the same topic as a message, the worship similar, but there's a very different vibe. And I think if you haven't ever experienced it, you would just be encouraged to come and see what God is doing in Framingham as well. So let me extend that invitation if you ever find yourself in a, a time when you'd, you'd want to check that out, to come and, come and check us out there. Um, oh, and that's a picture of us there in Framingham. Uh, as we worship. You'll notice we worship it around tables if you came to the Maundy Thursday service and we sat at tables. Same kind of thing. So again, it's a different vibe, but still very similar. So to, because today is Marathon Sunday, 
what we're going to do is we're going to look at some of the parallels between our own faith journey and running a marathon. And in the process, I think that that we just might be able to learn some lessons that would be helpful whether you're running a marathon or you're seeking to strengthen your own faith. After all, it was the writer of the book of Hebrews that encouraged us to run with endurance the race that is set before us. Kind of, kind of sounds like a marathon, doesn't it? And I'm also going to draw from some of my own experience. As Pastor Mike mentioned, I ran the marathon. Now, you'll be able to tell from the graininess of the photos you'll see, it was a long time ago, which may kind of shock you given the svelte figure you see in front. But it was, it was 2001. It was 2001 when I ran it. And um, it was the first competitive race I'd ever run. Uh, but I got, I got to the finish line. And so what we're going to do is we'll look at five lessons that I learned through that experience, and then we'll talk a little bit about how they might have parallels with your own faith journey as it does with mine. All right? So first one, lesson number one that I learned about running a marathon is that you have to run with purpose. You have to run with purpose. This might sound like a bit of an odd place to start, but when you're embarking on a long run like the marathon, it's critical that you're motivated by a purpose that's bigger than just the race itself. Because a marathon is really more of a journey than a destination. And it's a journey that's full of highs and lows and victories and defeats and ups and downs and good times and bad times. And if you're not running with a purpose, that's bigger than just the race, you're going to quickly get discouraged and you regularly are going to feel like you want to stop and you want to quit. So whether it's to support a cause, remember a loved one, or prove something to yourself, studies repeatedly show that runners who are running for a clear purpose are more successful and they're more likely to achieve their goals You might have even noticed an ad campaign that's been running on TV from Bank of America that's kind of saluting runners who are running for a purpose that's bigger than themselves. Um, One of them even has a, a pretty neat video about it, but it's really kind of saluting how many people are doing that. One thing that motivated me to run a marathon, it was really the reason I decided to do it way back then, is that I wanted to find something that I couldn't decide on one day I wanted to do it, and then on the next day, do it, all right? If if you're going to run a marathon, it takes some dedication, it takes practice, it takes training, and you just can't decide one day you want to run a marathon, and the next day, go run it. It takes a Now, there are some people who would decide one day they wanted to run a marathon, and they are able to run a marathon. And I just have to say, again, kind of deep down in my heart, you know, I really don't like people like that. <laughs> Something God's working on me about, but I mean, I know they're out there. Um, almost threw out a few names. I know there's some people in here that could do that, but anyway, um, you know, generally speaking, this is something that takes, it's, it's a long-term uh, thing to embark on. And I think that's the first parallel that running a marathon has with our own spiritual journey. Following Jesus, it's also full of ups and downs and victories and defeats. There are times when God feels close to us. There's times when God feels far away from us. And during those difficult times, it's so important that we remember that our spiritual journey is so much bigger than us and so much bigger than just today. In Philippians 3.14, Paul says, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So we don't run aimlessly. We run with a purpose, and it says that we are called heavenward. So what does that mean, to be called heavenward? It's easy to think 
that it means our goal is to be in God with heaven after we die. And that is part of it. That is part of it. But we're going to miss out on so much if our only motivation in following God is so we can go to heaven when we die. It's important to remember the Bible was written a long time ago to people from different cultures than our culture that spoke different languages than we spoke. There are eternal truths in the Bible, but we need to know how those words would be heard by the people they were written for so that we don't miss out on that underlying message. In our culture today, we often think of eternal life as something that we get after we die. That's kind of the Western view of eternal life. It's an end destination. But that's not how the people in the time of Jesus thought of that idea of eternal life. For them, eternal life was not something you get only after you die. It's something that starts here, on earth, in this life, because it begins with the gift of living a full life here on earth. In other words, eternal life is just as much of a journey as it is a destination. And it's what Jesus was referring to in John 10.10 10, when he says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Some translations say that they might have it abundantly. That starts here on earth. That's not just something that starts after we die. Our faith journey should make a positive difference for us today, now, and that should be a huge motivator for you when you're in those tough times. And part of living that full life is consistently living the purpose that God has created you for. Perhaps that's something that you're struggling to understand. If that's your situation, I just want to remind folks and kind of call your attention to the SHAPE program that we have here at church, right? The SHAPE program recognizes that we are all kind of a collection, a unique collection of spiritual gifts, heart, abilities, personality, and experience. And the SHAPE program helps you identify what your own personal shape is helps you understand how God may be crafting you and how you could really utilize all of those aspects of your own life to really be making the most of, in, in serving God. So if it's something you've never given much thought to, I'd consider that, and there's a QR code. It's, it's taking you to a link on our webpage, so you can always just go to the website and, and take a look if that's something that you might want to dig into a little bit more. So that's lesson one, run with purpose. Let's go to lesson two. Lesson two, get off the couch. <laughs> Might sound obvious, but let's be realistic. One of those things that's often a whole lot easier to say than to do. Every race starts with a start line and a finish line. But if you want to run a marathon, you have to put a lot of work in before you get to the start line if you want to be successful. It was like that for me, right? I decided I wanted to run the marathon about a year before the race was going to be happening. So, so I sprang into, earth, uh, sprang into action. First thing I did, I renamed my dog Five Miles. <laughs> See, that way I could tell everybody, hey, I walked five miles every day this week. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> hey, this still can be a 53-minute talk, right? Let me just, let's be, be careful here. All right. But one thing I did, I got a lot of books. I read a lot of books by f the famous coaches and the famous runners and, uh, and, and went through all those. And, you know, when I was done with that, after naming my dog, and that was a picture of my dog, by the way, but after naming my dog, reading the books, how much better prepared did you think I was? Yeah, not really much better prepared. But you know what? I felt better prepared. And that's because there's this 
really interesting phenomenon, and it's called vicarious goal fulfillment. I don't know if you've ever heard that term before. I hadn't heard the term, but I've certainly experienced what it means. It's the idea that we get a sense of accomplishment just by hearing someone tell us that we're going to be able to do something or that there's something that can be done. It's the phenomenon that motivational speakers kind of build their business on because people will come and hear a motivational speaker speak about doing something and people leave feeling like they've done something about it. When all they've really heard is someone talk about doing stuff about it, but we feel that inside. Like you could hear someone talk to you about that you can run this marathon and suddenly you feel like you've taken some real steps to achieve it. So, you know, I realized that just changing my dog's name, reading some books wasn't going to do it right. I had to do some really, some hard work. And there's a real parallel for that here in our own faith journey because it's also, well, I said it's what maybe a lot of motivational speakers will, um, you know, kind of build their business around. It's, it's something that pastors have to really battle against, frankly, when they preach because people will hear a sermon on a topic and then they'll feel like they've done something about it just because they've heard. So I would just kind of challenge you to reflect on yourself, right? Are you listening to more podcasts about praying or are you praying, right? Are you reading a book on how you need to be a really good neighbor to those around you or are you rolling up your sleeves and getting your hands dirty, uh, helping those who are in need around you? Dr. Kenitra Bryant put it really well. Here's a, a, a statement she had. Making the conscious, determined decision to follow Jesus is paramount for any relationship to grow, thrive, and develop into the God-honoring purpose it's intended to serve in one's life. Determination in following Jesus requires action, commitment, sacrifice, and fortitude. And there was a Ugandan uh, pastor, Grace Kaiso, and she says, Jesus seeks to clarify to people that following him is not a laissez-faire affair, not something we just sit back on. It's a decision that must be taken consciously with an acute awareness of the sacrifices and the unwavering commitment that it demands. Running a marathon does not take superhuman ability. Believe me, if I could do it, anybody can do it. The key is that you have to be intentional about it and make the daily decision to commit to what's needed. And our own spiritual journey isn't any different. God is not looking for spiritual superheroes. But it does require making a daily intentional decision to actively follow Jesus to deepen your relationship with him. It's more than just showing up on Sunday, oh, that's, although that's an important part too. All right, so that's lesson two. Lesson one was run with purpose. Lesson two, get off the couch. Lesson three, get running partners. This was really critical for me. You know, for people who live in this part of the country, one of the biggest challenges, I think, with running the Boston Marathon is that some of your hardest training has to be done in the middle of the winter. And let me tell you, when you are planning to go for a run and it's snowing or it's sleeting outside or it's single digit temperatures, it is really tough to get motivated. But one thing that I had was a group of friends and we all trained together. We would be up hours before the sun rose and we would meet somewhere to do training runs. What we typically did was we would try to run twice during the week, and then we would do a long run on Saturdays. And we were a pretty, you know, casual and affirming group of runners. We weren't the real intense ones. And so if, if you had an early morning meeting during the week or you maybe were feeling a little under the weather, you know, it was okay if maybe you didn't make one of those runs. But we had one rule. Only one rule. The one rule was you can't miss the Saturday run. It doesn't matter if it's a blizzard outside. doesn't matter if you're feeling under the weather. You had to be 
at the Saturday run and do it. And I can tell you, and my wife will she'll tell you, I'm not preaching now, I'm, this is the truth, that um, I would come in and my water bottle would be frozen or I'd have icicles hanging down off of my eyebrows. And I could have never done that on my own. Right? The only reason I could do that is I had made this commitment to my friends and they were doing the same thing and that was how we got through our training runs. And again, it's not really any different in our own Christian walk. God doesn't intend for us to go on this journey by ourselves. It's something that we should be doing together. So, one way is if you're not already in a faith group, then I can't think of anything that would be more helpful for your own spiritual journey. Because meeting regularly with like-minded people that will walk alongside you is really powerful. The book of Hebrews puts it really well. Oh, there's a picture of some folks meeting together. But the book of Hebrews, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And Acts chapter 2 really sets the model, sharing how members of the early church devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer doing that together. It's not just about being able to have a group to meet with for prayer and Bible study either. It's just as important to have a group that you can simply do life with. People that will come alongside you in happy times and in sad times. And just like my running partners were there to encourage me and to hold me accountable, a faith group can do the same thing for each other. In the first letter to the Thessalonians, the Apostle Paul says, we cared for you because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. There is another time when having a running partner is, is really important. It's when you're in the middle of the race and things are starting to get tough for me, that really started to hit me when I was entering Wellesley. Here's another grainy photo of me entering Wellesley. For you that might not be real familiar with the course, Wellesley is basically the halfway point. It's basically the, the, the halfway point of the race. And as I was entering the town, I could tell in the crowd that there was kind of a buzz going on. And my family was there. They had set up and I knew they were going to be there in Wellesley to say hi as I went by and give me, a, give me a high five. And so I said, what's, what's everybody talking about? And they said, the lead runners have crossed the finish line and they're talking about who won. <laughs> and kind of like, I'm like, what? <laughs> they're done? I'm, I am literally at the halfway point and we're celebrating people being done. I was not motivated right then. That did not pump me up when I realized that, right? So, so what am I going to do to rekindle that fire to keep going when I'm only at the halfway point and people are starting to, you know, kick back and be done? Well, I mentioned I had read, for example, books by and about those elite runners who were the ones who had already crossed the finish line. And they weren't going to motivate me to keep going. You know who motivated me to keep going, right? It was my running partner who was still there with me, encouraging me to keep going. And it was also that person who I didn't know, but who was just like five feet in front of me. Who I'm like, I just got to try and keep up with this person, you know? I just want to stay with them. I want to see if I can pass them. It's that person right there with you, right there with you. And it's, again, it's no different in our own spiritual walk. When you hit difficult times and your motivation might be starting to slip, where are you going to get your encouragement? Well, maybe you've read biographies of some of the spiritual giants, and they may provide you some motivation, but you're going to find that it's those people that you are doing life with who are walking alongside you, and maybe you feel are just a step ahead of you that are going to be your motivation to keep going. And those are going to be the exact same people that you 
can also help motivate to keep going because we're all in this together. So again, if you're not already in a faith group, I would really encourage you to take that step. Uh, again, there's a QR code. It takes you to our webpage, to the page on groups. And um, I'd, I'd encourage you to look into that if you aren't already in a faith group. So that was lesson three, right? That was, we are, we're running with a purpose. We're getting off the couch. We have our running partners. Now it's time for the race, right? The gun goes off. But of course, if you're like, if you're like me, that means you stand there for another 10 minutes. You don't actually start running yet, right? So you wait, you wait about 10 minutes, all the runners in front of you going, and then you start to run, right? And then the adrenaline kicks in, and then you get going. And um, so if you are ever in the race, um, you get about two miles into the race, and you come to the church. We're, we're, a little, we're about two miles into the race. And if you look over on the right side where, um, where our church is, you're going to see... Um, you're going to see my wife, Karen, who's out there somewhere, holding her sign that says, um, with God, all things are possible. And here you see some pictures over the years of her. You see there on the top left with Pastor Mike and different members of our family and friends. She's done it off and on for about 20 years. And what's really cool is you'll see runners who have run many times in the race and they know to look for her sign, and they come over and they high five her, or they slap the sign. So it's kind of neat and uh, something that she's done every year. She hasn't been able to be at there every year over the last 20 years, but when she's able to be there, she knows right where that sign is. She gets it and she brings it with her, and that's a lot of fun. But after you get past that, right, it doesn't take long for the excitement to start to, to wear a little thin, and it kind of begins to feel like. A marathon, <laughs> right? And that's the big reason that you need to remember lesson four. Lesson four is you have to use the water stations. You have to use the water stations. Now, there's usually between about eight and 12 water stations in a marathon. And you figure that to, 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 to go to a water station, right, you have to slow down. You usually don't stop, but you might have to. But you're going to lose about 10 seconds to swing over to a water station. So if you're doing that for eight to 12 times, you're gonna lose a couple of minutes of time in your race by stopping and you, taking advantage of these water stations. But of course, if you don't stop at these water stations, the dehydration that's gonna set in is gonna cause you to lose a whole lot more than two or three minutes. And it might even mean you're not gonna be able to finish the race at all, right? It's, I mean, it's really important that you take time to get refreshed and replenished when you're running the race. Even if you're those elite runners, they take advantage of those water stations. And once again, it's no different in our spiritual journey. When we encounter struggles, when we feel distant from God or feel that we're not going to make it to the finish line, that same principle applies. And what's the spiritual equivalent of a water station? Well, I think there are a couple of things. I mean, first, not to be a broken record, but being part of a strong community can be one of those really good sources of, of strength and refreshment. Near the end of 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul calls out three people that he's particularly thankful for. He says, I was glad when Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus arrived because they have supplied what was lacking from you. There's maybe a little of a backhand. No, yeah, yeah. But then he says, for they refreshed my spirit and yours also. Such men deserve recognition. Look for people like that and seek to be like that yourself because it comes full circle. Here's Proverbs chapter 11. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. It's a circle. But there are some occasions where you might feel that you need some focused time of refreshment. Some time giving yourself what is referred to as soul care. Soul care is the attention given to healing a wounded soul or maintaining a healthy soul. It's often linked to finding help 
to overcome temptations, fight addictions, and have peace with God. But it's also part of a healthy spiritual practice. We're blessed as a church to have Laurel Kulbaugh, our pastor of group life, who has a goal of helping Faith Community Church develop a culture that values soul care. Over the past year, we've held classes on emotionally healthy spirituality and emotionally healthy relationships. And there's another EHS class that's coming up soon, and it has a registration deadline at the end of the month. We also have resources for group and individual spiritual direction, and we have great resources with our partnership with the sanctuary at Woodville for doing individual or group spiritual retreats. If any of that sounds like something you would be interested in or want to take advantage of or learn more about, then reach out to Pastor Laurel, and I have her email address up there as well. Or you can get it, again, on the website uh, and reach out to Pastor Laurel. All right, so... We've gone through four. We have one more lesson. And that lesson is to finish strong. We want to finish strong. At the end of the day, it comes down to putting one foot in front of the other for 26.2 miles. I was fortunate that towards the end, you'll see those folks with their hands up around me. It's my two brothers and two of my brothers-in-law who jumped in and they ran the last few miles with me, which was a lot of fun and really probably something that doesn't can't really happen much anymore with the security measures, and they don't really let people do that kind of stuff anymore, but they were much less formal about that back in the old days. Um, So I was was fortunate, and that was a lot of fun. Uh, And again, our spiritual journey is not much different, right? Here's another verse from Proverbs. Let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. Ponder the path of your feet, then all your ways will be sure. Don't swerve to the right or the left. Turn your foot away from evil. Those could be words for running a race, right? Keep your eyes ahead, one foot in front of the other. And when we hit that spiritual heartbreak hill, James says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And 2 Timothy says, the perspective on finishing that race, I fought the good fight, I finished the race, I kept the faith. Now you see in front of you here uh, this wreath. So the wreath is what the, if you come across first, you get the wreath. We don't all get the wreath. But they do give, right? They give everybody a, a medal. So here's the medal that I actually got handed to me that I, you can see me wearing in there. I mean, that was pretty cool to be able to get the, uh, the medal for finishing. And... Um, right? That's our goal. It's, it's not about perfection, right? It's, it's, it's about perseverance and staying faithful to the end with, with that community that's surrounding you. So I hope you had some fun walking through my marathon experience uh, along with me and learning a little bit about how it might apply to our own spiritual journey. So we talked about these five lessons, running with purpose, getting off the couch, getting running partners, and using water stations and finishing strong. So I hope those are things that you can keep in mind, whether you're running a physical race or you're running a spiritual race. And if you're running tomorrow, whether you're listening online or here, let me just say, may the wind be at your back, may you stay safe, and may we all finish the race well. Amen. Amen. Thank you.